Yeah, because I'd love to get both of your takes as the as weird ass having done that shared workshop, because I know that was the first time and we didn't really get a lot of time to talk about how that went for you mm -hmm. and what your takeaways were in teaching with that dynamic in Austin. Um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to re I'm trying to refresh my mind of the whole mm -hmm. the whole thing. It was really a great experience for me. I felt um, it's like a, a kind of a fat, uh, uh, getting up to speed so so quickly with so many, getting to play with so many people. That was the first time we did that type of workshop. And now it's become a part of thing that we, we like to do. Um, uh, Everybody's it was, waking up, I'm so sorry. No, it's okay, it was. <laughs> the <worst> answers. <laughs> My my experience, I'll share my experience of going through it because the, the thing was for anyone listening who wasn't aware, uh, Stephanie would play with the people in the workshop and Bob would direct and give notes. And one thing that I remember feeling, and I've I felt this once more when we when I got the chance to play with the the, the lottery from Dasariski. But when we went through the exercise, one of the exercises that stood out was like, I think you call it the Starbucks exercise, or like the support, where the two people are in the scene, granted scene, and then was, they're in the drive. Yeah, I'm sorry, that was given to us by our good friend, uh, Liz Allen, uh, uh, which was a, a great uh, uh, exercise to work with. Yeah, I, the, the experience that I remember from it was feeling the support from the outside. Stephanie, like you were the per, you were the attendant, and it wasn't coming into the scene saying my funny joke, getting out. It was coming in, having heard what was going on in the scene, saying something that like heightened and explored, made our thing right that we were doing. And it's such a different feeling when someone supports you versus like just coming on. And saying their funny thing. And, and I think it's d improvising from a different headspace when you know that that is the task at hand. Uh, because I think when you're in the middle of a show, you're just kind of salt and peppering, you know, scenes here and there. Sometimes I think we've all been, I won't say guilty of it, because it's, you know, fine to kind of come in and touch a scene. But when you're, when the, um, when the whole goal of it is like, you have to make an appearance, but it has to be in support of what is happening in this car to heighten and move that scene forward. Um, mm. it, yeah, I, I feel like that particular exercise is so good at that, honing in on that very quickly. Uh, I think maybe just because we all know what the Starbucks experience is and <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you're expecting that person at the window uh, so those variables are in place. I love that you're like locked in a car. And when Liz is teaching the scene, she's very direct about like, this is an emotional scene. This isn't a funny scene. Like we're going to approach it uh, where, you know, something heavy has happened in this car that you two are discussing. Uh, and still the funny will kind of appear from that. It's a great exercise. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's it's so important to be listening to everything that's going on on stage anyway. It's a great exercise to focus on that because you are supposed to be walking into this these scenes having heard, like you want to be aware of everything that's going on so you can serve whatever the scene is that you are entering. Uh, and if you're just sitting passive on the on the sidelines and then you jump in because you, you got a funny line, then you're not doing service to what's already been established out there. You had mentioned, uh, Stephanie, I think you said like trust that like the grounded emotional thing, trusting that the funny will appear, the funny will come. Mm -hmm. But Buckman had said something to me, some similar, like I can just trust myself to do this and the, the funny will, uh, will come. Is there, are you, are you thinking of that? Like, while you, while, while both of you are, are performing, is there some sort of pursuit of, ground grounded emotional not being funny like what like are kind of like the the things under the hood in your minds going into this i feel like when anytime i'm going into a show um that that is my goal is like to play it as grounded as i can because i already know i have a a, a tendency or a love for broadness and fun characters that are uh you know i just love the 
quirkiness of people. And so I know that's going to show up anyway. So when I'm kind of trying to offset it with something that's really, you know, grounded, it keeps me from, and, and fighting the temptation for going for a line or maybe making a character choice that I've made before, um, that it, it, uh, it, it does put you in a place, um, where you're on, I don't want to say honest, but, um, keeps you from those temptations. Because I think when you've been improvising as long as we have, you know, you're approaching every show with a different energy level sometimes, you know, depending on what's happened to your day. And uh, you can fall into old habits or you can, you know, kind of do lazy I improv or maybe it's not like taking off immediately. And we just did a show here in LA and the team before us, uh, King 10 played. And I mean, they are, they're so funny and they're a well-oiled machine and we were watching them and and you know the audience was with them every step of the way and I thought oh gosh like here we're going to do this very slow patient two-person show um how's this going to go over because we're going to switch gears um and, and people will just go with you as long as you're you know as long as you're laying out your intention like they're they'll, they'll be on board so I've lost the thread of your question, but I think it was. Um... <laughs> well, like the, the approach. Uh, we're, we're, yeah. we're both from the uh, the truth and comedy mentality. And um, we both have done, you know, crazy stuff as well. And we know that without the foundation, like you have nowhere to build from. If you just start in insanity, then there's nowhere to go. And also, um, when you start with that foundation, like I've said, the audience, uh, you build a trust with the audience that they're in good hands. You know, if you've ever watched improv mm -hmm. where you think the wheels are going to fall off the bus and you're like, ah, like that's not a great audience experience if you're not trusting what's happening on stage. Um, and we know that when we start with a, with a, a foundation, then we have somewhere to build. Uh, so we try to approach it with, you know, honesty and, and truthfulness. And Three things I think I, or, uh, that whenever I'm going is like, yeah, try not to go for the laugh. Try to play as honest and uh, uh, gen, you know, emotionally genuine as I, as I, you know, can and try to surprise myself, which is the part where you're allowing something that you never factored in. And I have to say, when I was playing with you guys, when we were doing the class, the workshop, it had been you know, two years, because we were coming out of the pandemic that I, I had even performed. And it was the best warm up ever. I mean, it really, um, you know, the idea behind it was, I learned the most when I was playing with people who had been doing it longer than I had. It was the scariest for me. But that is really where I gleaned a lot of my Yeah, just seeing somebody do their thing and do it really well really raises your bar. Um, and so uh, playing with someone who's experienced while Bob coached, that was kind of the premise of, of the, the class. It, but yeah, being in there, it was um, such a learning moment for me too, because as an improviser, like just because you have improvised honestly before, it doesn't mean you're always going to take that route. And uh, anyway, it was a great experience and we're looking forward to doing it again. That's our cat tearing up the couch. One second. <laughs> I love see this loves this one arm chair of a couch and it's becoming frayed. Uh, I mean, this is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, no. uh, so yeah, I hope that kind of answers your yeah, question. Yeah. And you've gotten to do this workshop a few more times since Austin? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Damn it, that was my one question, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of what we're, we're the, the framework that we're kind of using now as we are going to different, some different cities. In the yes, summer. and mm. off the record, we're, we're starting to build something with uh, Vermont uh, that we'll, we'll talk to, I'll talk to you more off thing, but, uh, oh, nice. and, and, but we, we, we intend to do that uh, class again in, uh, uh, in, Austin and uh, hopefully in a couple of other cities. I've never been a teacher. I don't feel, you know, like I've been asked to teach a lot uh, over the years. And um, it's just not something I felt uh, for whatever reason, my mind just doesn't work that way. I have a hard time getting on stage and telling, you know, people, you know, 
the the formula to do it or or the whatever uh if i when i switch gears that way it's almost like uh it puts me in my head when I improvise too much. I have a fine time having other people tell me this. And so the way we thought this would work best was if, you know, if maybe I was just kind of doing it, you know, uh, performing and Bob do it. Yeah, because the the thing the thing that works so well is like you're if you know if you're saying you you don't like that 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 approach to teaching, I would say like my experience of the thing was that your method of teaching was showing yeah. well, for me to experience it. It's one thing, like you'd mentioned, it's nice. Like you learn from seeing other people that are better around you. I feel like it's a whole nother level when you like viscerally experience it for yourself playing with that person who's above you. It's a completely different feeling. I think so too. And I think it's also like seeing them make great choices and then seeing them make some bad choices. I feel like when um, uh, Beto and I got a chance to redo our scene that we had started with, like, you know, it, it ended up being such a fun scene. And it was like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, approaching it with more solid footing or, you know, and I don't remember the specifics of how we adjusted the scene, but it was a real lesson too. Yeah. That was the idea of the takeaway. The redoing. I don't, set up, I don't want to set up the fact that I, uh, I don't always do great scenes. And that, <laughs> that is a really good lesson yeah. for all of us, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a lot, a lot less pressure. Um, the, the redoing the scenes, that was like the first time that I'd actually experienced doing that or watching it be done. Is that something that when you, when you were learning, coming up, that you, that y'all experienced? Did the did the coaches do that? No, and it was actually a really great thing when Steph uh, wanted to redo the scene. And uh, again, another thing that we're incorporating or, or that I'm going to incorporate in teaching because we didn't do it a lot of that. It was almost like some some notes during the scene, like we would freeze, now go on and freeze and go on, but never like okay, let's try that again, but this time, you know take those cues or, or whatever see if you can approach it differently and i think i think when i was mm. in classes i'm sure everybody's felt that like you get off stage and you're like oh gosh if i could just yeah. that was kind of the key that would have made the scene so different but it's gone you know uh and so no no i we i never experienced that that on stage i would have loved to have done that no we're going to try to do that uh some more uh in in the teaching because it's fun there's also there's also the, the 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 feeling though, like also the uh you know you have one shot kind of thing, so it's a it's a balance between that because you don't want to be like oh we're gonna redo this one and we can we can do it better next time, so it's a you want to you want to, but the feeling of of redoing it and going see that felt when you took those cues that's the visceral thing you're talking about where it's like oh that that sits in you and you go okay and so your approach to scenes becomes. Uh, different because sometimes you can look at a scene and be like you know in your mind think uh oh my scene partner chose something do you, why did they put us in a fishery like I don't know anything about fish or you know and you can kind of tag it on all of these other variables but when you get a shot at a scene in a location like that that's so unfamiliar to you and it goes really well I mean you feel like uh you know unstoppable but the world you could do you could do a scene anywhere because it's really it's just always about the relationship between the two people not about the particulars of the environment of the what's, what's it the job at hand hmm. Steph, you mentioned you don't consider yourself a teacher i was wondering how you feel about talking shop about improv in general uh like an idiot i feel like i'm like <laughs> i feel <laughs> like uh I, it's you know it, Oh, um, I'm I'm happy to spew my opinions, but I'm always kind of like I don't know. I think that's maybe that's right. I, um, unless you know, we're unless it's just I or I. What a good note. I could coach Bob all day long. I'm really <laughs> good, but it, got a great point of view. In that, um, you know, we had. Uh, yeah, I, I, we have friends, Dana and Julia, uh, their comedy team who um, 
were just the raunchiest or are the raunchiest improvisers. You would proudly, ever proudly, 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 so raunchy. And this was back in the day. And they asked me to coach their team. And I'm a bit of a, I don't, you know, if it's funny, it's funny. I don't care, you know, what it's about, but I can be a bit of a pearl clutcher. And so my, uh, we would do rehearsals and Julia was uh, saying that her parents were coming to the show tonight and uh, that night. And I was just like, and she's from Oklahoma. And I was just like, well, maybe ladies challenge yourselves. Like, you know, like, just don't, you know, talk, you know, keep, keep, it, keep it high, no low hanging fruit or whatever. This was my advice to them. Anyway, the show they did was about their labias and it was, you know, that was just their style. And I thought, God, why would I sway them away from that when that's just really where they live? And they, you know, they wrote a show that went to the Aspen Festival and they did their thing. So I think that's really my reservation about teaching or putting, giving my input to any artist is sometimes I, I'm, I'm always worried I'm going to cross a line and, you know, prevent someone from, you know, putting, do, doing their, their interpretation of comedy. And I think that's just, you know, I think to be a good teacher, you kind of have to trust that that's, that you won't do that, that you're just giving your personal input. So. I, I feel like maybe, um, Instead of like, if, if it helps to rephrase this next question, instead of like, how how should you do this of like opening up, up under the hood for y'all? Like, how do you do this of like both of you? How, I'm thinking of like support, you know, experiencing that support there. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'll hear, you know, oh, make your partner look good or support them, right? Like, but like, how do you do that? Like, for for both of you, when you think support my partner, make them look good, like w how are you approaching that, or is it even not conscious anymore? Uh, well, yeah, we've been doing it for a while, where I think it's it's built in, where it is just the the idea of on a very uh, simplistic level is playing catch, and and part of the making your partner look good is catching what they're throwing and throwing something back and so it becomes a, a perpetual motion of 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 this thing developing um and we we pursue it that way it's like we have it's, there's two of us on stage so to ignore you know one of the people on stage it's <laughs> really a disservice to the whole system and i have to say i've learned from bob improvising with bob over the years and in every incarnation i've ever been in i've never seen him judge a uh, a choice or a line or I mean like it never mm. flat, you know and, and by judge I just mean like uh, be stutter stepped by something that someone has offered because sometimes that can read to the audience or to yourself as you know kind of a judgment of like oh okay I didn't know we were going there or whatever he's never ever done that to me I've never seen him do it to any other play on stage he's 110 percent like this is the choice that we've both decided to make. And this is, you know, the reality that we're working in. And so that's kind of how I've gotten better at it. At it. <laughs> He's the stronger one at that total, total non-judgment. So Steph, you said the magic word of the day, judgment. Eric yeah. and I were, were having a very <sighs> philosophical discussion about it while we were warming up and getting <sighs> everything set up today. Um, how do you two, I'm just, interested to pick your brain about distinguish the judgment voice versus the artistic expression voice where this is my choices and as the performer uh and it's not necessarily getting in your head as a judgment is there a distinction and how are i mean are you talking about ha having that thought on stage uh, uh like in the middle of a scene yeah in the middle of a scene like in, in your pursuit of not going for the low-hanging fruit for example oh, how does that yeah. become Part of your artistic expression versus uh, judgment that might get in your head. Or... Oh, that's really a good question because you're right. Like, it, uh, there is an inherent sense of judgment and being like, "Oh, I'm not going to go there." Like an internal judgment versus an external judgment, like judging or or both. Are you I think both about... in, in general. Okay, yeah, like like a subject or a you know topic or well, see, I think that's just like a, um, it's just like conversation. You know, if you're having a conversation and somebody is like, uh, you know, starts uh, talking garbage about somebody, you know, you have the choice to join in on that or you can gently sway it away. If that's not what you're 
what your um, let's say I don't want to say preference, but let's say let's like if you we can we can um, you can make movement that's not a denial to somebody and still bringing it like because I think we know we we know pitfalls. And we know, like, I don't mm -hmm. know, like when you're talking about something off stage or something that's happening or plot, you know, we don't necessarily judge it, but we recognize when that's happening. And so we can, with all these tools, bring it back to the present and the relationship and build on that. So I, I, I find it's less judgment and more awareness of, you know, because there's mm -hmm. sometimes you need to... Um, you know, be aware of where the scene is and what you can do to help it. And then what's beautiful is when it takes off on its own and you don't have to worry about that at all. Um, and, but that there is the, 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 you know, the in your head thing, when people say, oh, I get in my head, that's judgment. But when you are, uh, but I always say, is like, I want you, I want you conscious when you're on stage I don't want it because it's not accidental, the stuff that happens. I don't want you to just be fumbling around, you know, going, well, I hope it happens. I hope it works. You know, there's a, there's a skill to it to be uh, aware of what a scene is and what it needs to be and where it's going and then be able to let go and let it go wherever it's going. And I think maybe the discernment to make if we're talking about the same thing is it's less about taste level in the judgment or artistic pursuit it's less about you know um mentally thinking you know a, 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 about a taste level and more about what's going to get the scene farther um because mm -hmm. i think some of of i would say if you're going to call it judgment that i would have you know younger playing with scenes is like there would be a funny initiation that the audience would totally laugh at, but as a performer who's in the scene, it may have pulled the rug out of the scene completely. Like suddenly we're, uh, you know, bad example, but you know, we've been in this space and the scene is working and everybody's, you know, enjoying it. And then the partner says we're on Mars and it's kind of like, you know, you're throwing the brakes. I feel like um, for me, that's the criteria is, what is in service to the scene? What is surprising for the scene? What is not something that you've seen in every single show? Because sometimes, uh, you know, uh, it, it's easy to fall into, you know, uh, you know, dick jokes or, or you know, kind of the uh, low hanging fruit, as we say. And it's not because it's, you know, funny is funny. And if it's inspiring and furthering the scene, great. If it's just kind of an easy, you know, move, it's just not going to get you as far. So maybe that's the differentiation of uh, versus because you're right, like judgment doesn't have a place really on the improv stage. Uh, and, you know, we're we're trained to be like <clears throat> that would say, treat your uh, audience like kings and queens mm -hmm. and let them come to you. So instead of, you know, pandering to the audience, mugging or doing jokes or whatever, the idea is that this is a, you know, a. I want to say sacred or safe place that these this this thing is happening, and you know you, you play with people with like minds in the sense that you're all pursuing a a, a similar direction mm -hmm. where um, where conflict and judgment comes from when somebody's playing wackadoodle and the other person wants to play you know grounded or whatever and that could cause conflict. But the idea is to work with people that are 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 challenging you to raise the bar um, and then the judgment fades away because now you're trusting everybody around. And if you trust everybody, there is no judgment because this is where you're going. This is where you are. Uh, and we're going to go from here. Um, the judgment comes from when you're not sure what somebody's doing. And, and I've been on stage with people that have like taken, you know, uh, uh, you know taken some, ugly stabs at things and you, you go ah you know you you have that reaction now i have to work with right you. now i gotta now thanks for this it maybe you feel like play the same note every time in a scene or maybe always make such a familiar choice that it almost feels like your hand is tied behind your back mm -hmm. that you you know like oh shoot we're gonna do this scene again 
And that is where a judgment can slip in. And as a creator or an artist, you might need to, you know, really honor that idea that, no, you can make something magical out of anything. And, you know, because I've seen it done. If, you know, you're putting someone on stage uh, uh, with a different improviser um, and you get a whole other show and you're like, wow, never thought of approaching their energy that way. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a really interesting question because I think when you're working in an ensemble constantly and, you know, Bob and I, I've had, you know, we've had conversations about peculiar little things that we were doing on stage, because I think you could look at our show. We're very physical. Uh, I do broad characters. Um, there are definitely familiar areas that we as performers tread on because that's kind of the tone of our show. Um, we do like that. I think the self judgment comes from trying to keep it fresh for us and surprising for one another, surprising each other, surprising ourselves too. Because we do, we can, after you do a lot of shows, you go, Oh, I've played this energy before, I've played this, or and you try, you know, you like, uh, like Dell would say, you know, choose the third choice, the first choice, the audience knows, second choice, you know, and the third, cho I think I'm butchering that, but mm -hmm. the point is to keep trying to grow and evolve and it's work in a sense because you don't rest on we we, tr we try to keep every show you're only as good as your last show and we try to do every show to the best of our ability to where we keep bumping that bar up for ourselves it doesn't the audience doesn't matter because they, they might be seeing us for the first time but for us we know it, it's almost like a I'll, I'll sure i'll talk about music it's almost like a band playing a song if you play playing the same song that becomes that becomes a prison where you are like oh we're gonna play this song again and it's like so we keep trying to keep it fresh mm -hmm. by uh pulling in what's going on in our lives right now which is very different than 10 years ago and so uh uh and approaching every scene with fresh eyes and a raised context. i'm curious what, what what is the context of kind of the question that you asked Oh yeah, what was your conversation? What was the? It, it kind of went all over the place, uh, but we were talking about um, like striving for perfection uh, in in the pursuit of something, and how that can be a slippery slope. I guess would be the theme. Er Eric's usually a lot better at encapsulating concepts than me. I don't know if he wants to chime in. Well, I don't want to get too sidetracked. We were we were talking. It came from the I I think from the idea of like we were talking about trying to produce content, you know, for my own like personal brand, for my voiceover business, for for selling out tickets to this weird ass show, which is going to be June 6th. Um, and, you know, the workshops and we we're talking about what can we be doing? And, and we're and we we're trying to you know, my approach to it was trying to like, you know, um, take away that judgment so that we can get more output done of mm -hmm. the thing like we we both took a second guessing all the ideas or yeah or like or like the idea need like wanting it to be a, a perfect idea or like hey mm -hmm. you know we're gonna make this thing but like this could be like fine-tuned a little bit and if we spend i could spend two days fine-tuning this poster for example that we did or say like oh, hey that's good enough like it, you know let's get this out in terms of hey we could get it, just for this example, like five posters out in the same time where I could like get the one poster perfect. Right, right. There's like, how much is that really going to matter? The person receiving that is the beauty is the eye of the beholder. It's there. And the judgment of, of me judging myself, stopping me from producing. Yeah. yeah. And isn't that the great thing about improv? I mean, as a writer, I do that all day long. It's like, ah, if I could just, you know, what I can find it, I can rework this, I can, you know, whatever, to the point where it just takes forever to get it done. But the beauty of improv and the lesson I would love to glean from that is just like, this is what it is today. And, you know, there's some magic in that because I think we all know, like there have been songs that have been written in 10 minutes that are just, you know, perfection. And that, uh, you know, just because you rework something to death does not necessarily make it better. Right. Um, so sometimes um, you weigh in on that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, because again, I don't have the exact answer, but there's, you know, the truth lies somewhere in between there, if not just phoning it in. So it looks like crap, but that you're, well, yeah, you're letting it go and being like, this is it. And it is raising that skill level so you can 
move things, you know, create things faster or, or create things and having a more like, because what, what perfection sometimes does is like, oh, I'm not good enough. I can't get it done, you know, but, but like it, improv is great because it's, it's exactly who you are right now. Like, so you are there. And so the next time you do a show, you, you learn from the last one and you try to pull all of those things and, and you when know, you're keep improvising well, sorry to cut you off. When you're improvising well, you're committing to yourself 110%. Yeah, yeah. I don't think in my day to day, like maybe I do that enough. And so there's a lesson there to be mm -hmm. like, you know, gosh, if I could commit to my choices, good, bad, indifferent, 110% in life daily, like it, you know, it might be a really good day. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned, you mentioned our show, uh, you said June 6th. 26th. I, 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 I meant 26. If I said six, edit that back in and put on the screen. Oh, it's 26. <laughs> As I was like, June 6. Uh oh. <laughs> oh. The 20th, June 20th. Uh, we were just yeah because we were just putting out all these posters that said June sixth and we, we, we weren't getting into edit mode. We were gonna figure that out later. That's it's perfection. perfection. Yeah, you are. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? The, it was we were just having. I guess it's a heady conversation for the morning, but it all always leads back to improv because to me, coming from a music world where I have to lug all this stuff around and make sure all the cables are connected just so I can get to be improvisatory and spontaneous and in the moment. I love just showing up at a theater or an alt space. And all I have to do is stand there, look at the person in front of me and pay attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. This like, this sounds, this sounds great. This feeling that talking about this sounds great. It feels so easy. And when I'm in it, you know, for me, I guess, kind of like diving into a little bit more of like the, the judgment, like in the head, you know, you said like, we want you in your head, we want you conscious. But like, it's like the, for me, I guess, when I think about the being in the head, it is a judgment. Oftentimes, it's probably like, I'm recognizing something that's happening where it's like a coach's head maybe comes in or like, or a rule of improv, like, oh, this is what we shouldn't be. We're talking about someone else that's not here or, or some whatever that thing that pops in my head of like, uh, this is a judgment, what's going on? isn't right or i need to i need to fix it or how whatever is going on it, it's making me think also of awareness of you're saying like you this is where you are here now you are here now in that moment i'm literally not in that moment i'm in my head judging thinking um if you can you are there any tips you know would you give your your former self if you ever ran into that problem like how to get out of that moment when when we find ourselves in that moment, in our head, judging, what would you say to someone to like snap out of that? Oh, or I, I, I've had this, this, this is my response to that. And you've probably heard this already, but it's whenever you're in your head and you want to get out of it, turn to your partner. The answers are always in your partner, especially if our first mm -hmm. job is to make our partner look good and we're all jammed up in our head, then we're not, taking in their physical cues, their auditory cues, their environment that they've created or anything. We're not taking them in, we're thinking about ourselves. And it's so freeing when you're like there to serve your partner that you start to, that's when you surprise yourself because then the things that you say uh, come out, it's like, I can't believe I said that because it is your mind like reacting to this environment uh, and if you put it on a focus on your partner, then it has somewhere to go instead of just spinning around in your head for a while. That's really good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think like when you're thinking, um, how do I support this best? What is the best emotional choice I could make right here? Those are my frozen moments. Those are mm. my, when I'm standing on stage being like, asking myself in questions, which road should I take? But if I'm genuinely listening to what my partner is saying or doing and just honestly responding to that. And that's that perfection thing because you could, you know, watch a scene, get an opening line and then sit with a bunch of people and write out what's the next line. And it would be perfect. And then, all right, let's do that for the third line. But in improv, the, there's no such thing as perfect. It's just present, like the, the now. And so it's not saying, it's not responding to your partner that will kill you. 
instead of having a building block to be like, okay, you, you, what you want to relieve yourself is that you're not going to, you, your line doesn't have to be all encompassing and answer all the questions and I, figure out all, like, it just has to be that next line. So then you have something to build on and building this thing together. And I, we just did a scene where it was like, we came out of the hot seat and it was kind of maybe a, a quick edit and Bob took the bullet of saying the first line because you know there's that weird space that you have where you have to like re-enter a scene and somebody's got to take the lead. And he turned to me and he said, "I think your line was, oh, it's so hard. I can't choose. There's so many. I, I can't. There's choose so many. I can't choose. Wonderfully ambiguous uh, and, and, and open-ended. Like, <laughs> literally, like, oh, uh, you know, like I'm standing in a. I mean, now I'm choosing." But I was like, I know he's talking about something. And I, you know, what is this? It was almost like decoding a clue. And so instead, I just let it go and went with my own thing. It worked out great. But in that moment, I could feel what you're talking about is like, oh crap, I'm at a crossroads right now where this, and we're just starting the show out. And I'm either about to like really freeze and throw the brakes on this by saying something equally as ambiguous. Like, you know, yes, there are a lot <laughs> from and then we're in the territory we're like okay now the game is naming it and 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 it better be really good um so um but he was yeah so it really was like okay i just have to take what he said and get behind a choice that's in my mind and just go with it and it worked out great because there's times when it's not perfect at all like what were you like i didn't know what you were i didn't know where you were or what you were doing it's like guess what? I didn't know where I was and what I was doing. <laughs> but he did take the bullet for starting, you know, that scene in that space where, you know, you just feel that moment, like somebody's got to say, you know, something. So but then sometimes um, you start a scene like that where it's very ambiguous. Uh, and then sometimes you start a scene where it's like, well, uh, we've got all of this food to make for Thanksgiving or something like, so sometimes it's, yeah. it, you know, and being able to deal with the scene when it's not perfectly delivered um and spending this very little time in that space you're talking about eric of question mark what's the best choice i can make right now right. you know kind, you know where you're mulling over ideas or whatever emotional ideas um is spending as little time as you're in there because it's not ultimately about the choice that you're making it's about making a really just picking one and going with it and lining up with it and getting behind it mm -hmm. and that, you know, and you're, you know, let the scene unfold because this is not the end point. There's going to be other things introduced along the way to. And I've talked about this with assumption, you're like making assumptions, like your partner says something. Uh, what can you glean? What clues can you glean from that um, to to then uh, uh, move the scene forward uh, with a with a detail or something like that? And uh, it, it, it's being able to do, handle when something's, you know, when you're called President Nixon or whatever, like when you're labeled something or when you're not labeled something. And there's there's everything in between that. That's too. a really good exercise mm. to have your scene partner start at really ambiguous, like, yeah. you know, almost making it as, you know, and your job is to land on your feet. Remind me of that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I think that is good. Because it, it really just it makes you make choices and those, know, are the, those are the exercises that I want to do is to, you know, have someone throw something at you that you've kind of, you know, got to figure out and be like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing's going to throw me up. We used to do an exercise. I remember this, it just flashed in me because we used to do an exercise like that in the beginning of improv and it was called It's Tuesday. Uh, do you remember that, no. that scene? It was just so you would, your partner would say, hey, it's Tuesday. And then your partner would have to then fill in why that's, oh, that's significant. There you go. There, there is an exercise. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I remember, I, but I just remember it like, what's funny is that we, I haven't done that exercise in 30 years, mm -hmm. but it just made a point to why that it's, it's a, it's about making choices. Uh, that's a great exercise. And come to the Weird Ass Workshop Monday, June 26th to find out if you actually do the Tuesday workshop or not. <laughs> the exercise. <laughs> um, speaking of uh, Weird Ass events, what are your memories? I recently watched the, the performance at the Rosette from last year. What are your memories off stage, but also, you know, have you, Steph, you had a lot of family um, yeah. come to the show? Like, what are your recollections of the experience of having done that? 
Uh, it's funny because I saw just saw that clip that you guys put together. <laughs> that was better. So fun to watch, and and I was like, man, I was moving around a lot. <laughs> I had some family to entertain um, <laughs> that day, and um, uh, let's see, recollections. Well, I, it, my the first a couple of recollections. One one was how we went into it. We were very very excited to be there and we were so happy to we haven't performed in like three years at that point so it was very exciting to get back at it but it was also the first show that our our kids saw of us doing show which was and, and a lot of family but specifically our kids which was exciting um it was a very clean show i remember that because it subconsciously we we're like we got our kids in the audience i think i said god one time and oh. uh you know like oh my god and i <laughs> I myself pressing it back in because I have a very straight and narrow niece that uh or she's a my cousin's daughter that um yeah, we just, it was fun too to realize like you know uh sometimes when you ha have those mental restrictions on what your choices are as far as like maybe not swearing or uh being mindful of people's point of view in life or you know whatever they're very they're very Christian and uh, it can open. It can you can surprise yourself on on the new choices that you make? Yeah, yeah. Uh, versus feeling bound to. Yeah, it opens up a whole another avenue where we we had a mermaid. Yes, the mermaid, <laughs> the mermaid, mermaid. really stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was it was it went by so quick, but it was really it was it was really great because um, uh, it was it was I, I think for us it was. Uh, uh, one of the most fun shows that we had in a long time, in a long time. it was really and, and it's helped us our, our approach to our show has become just more joyful and uh and and fun to do yeah do the or was it, there was a there was a couple of threads the the joyful thing you just mentioned i, I remember uh in the workshop the thing where someone had brought they're out in the woods and someone had brought a sandwich and someone was like ugh. And you were like, why not just be joyful, like happy that someone made a sandwich for you? <laughs> right, right. We set those, those negative emotions and it's like, uh, you know, it's not that they're not valid. It's just that when, like, like the, like we said, when you close that choice off, it's like, you know, what other range of positive emotions, if we do, if we just take a break from negative emotions for a bit and look at all the positive, there's a whole array of choices you can make that go beyond ug you know so why not entertain those and see what happens and start feeling there there and you know what we took you mentioned formula earlier it's like that the, the person that was responding to that was mentioning about a formula of like i was told if you want to make something bad make it worse or something like some some again some you know one plus two equals three some something and, and i find improvisation has nothing to do with math it has n nothing to do with that structure because then you're just going to start seeing, you know, like pop songs, which are like, you know, a, a verse, a verse, a refrain, you know, like, and then co the chorus. It's like, it's, it's just going to become, become rote, you know, and I love the... The Mad Libs of... of yeah, the Mad Libs of, of, of improv, which they're just not challenging and, and exciting to watch or, or for me, for my, for my case. Um, and so it's so much more about that... Um, the randomness and variety with a skill level involved in it to, to take him take us to places we've never expected like lake mermaid and and, and many <laughs> other things that we can you know mention in improv like that it's that's the joy of it for us is the um uh, is the pursuit of this thing and so yeah we're looking forward to doing shows and being coming back to austin and um Try to surprise ourselves. Like the last show that we did, like I think the day of the show, I was like, what if instead of bookending the show with two hot seat characters, you know, this is a format we've done for many, many years. Instead, we just do a duologue kind of based on our actual, you know, you know, lives, um, which is and and Bob was such a great yes and or he was just like, okay, okay. So, uh, uh, and so how would that look let's let's practice this you know how would that look anyway he just allowed me to make, come full circle and realize that was a horrible idea but he didn't say, <laughs> no. <laughs> say, he didn't say no. no to it he was like we're not ready to do it in two hours we could probably mm. use some 
Right. And I, I would say not a horrible idea, but uh, for the context of this show, it was not for, yes, probably yes. not the right. For what we were doing in that show. But who knows? Maybe once we get to Austin, we will have. <laughs> but it felt like there was a lot of surprise and joyful acceptance in the show as I rewatched it. There were moments where even creating friction or a negative point of view, like, oh, I hate those people. The other character would support with like, yeah, and that's why I love you. Or that's the the key to a happy marriage is hating the right hate. the same people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I thought that was really cool uh, way of like accepting the surprise, even if, you know, the the relationship, you know, there was a protester that tried was trying to shut down your restaurant. There are all these people working against each other, but it never felt like, an uphill battle or a fight it always just felt like of course this is happening well and i think fighting can i mean there can be some hilarity in fighting it's like a seasoning you want to use sparingly i would say and and one thing i'll, I'll that we have learned with our show is chasing a plot Ch you know if it suddenly became around about these two people fighting and what was going to happen to their storyline you can feel it wearing out quickly it has to evolve to something else and hopefully something with a little more levity or you know joyful connection it um yeah uh so that i don't know just a good thing that we keep in mind when we're pursuing performing sorry uh it's not to chase that plot yeah. okay. <laughs> this so, um yeah you know kakowski uh uh our good friend craig kakowski uh talks about uh you know uh, people bickering like, you know, a bicker is like, you don't want to just go out there and nobody wants to see two people having a petty fight, you know? It's, and it's never about the fight. It's never, you know, I, I we say that it's never about what you're doing, right? So if you're fighting, it's not about that. There's something else going on or, you know, a fight, you know, if you have a long-term relationship and you're fighting about, you know, where, where to put your shoes, that's a bigger issue um that you can you know explore and whatnot and it's it, you know it goes beyond the surface and so uh you know dig in a little bit and heighten and explore from what i when <laughs> the people are saying uh, the... <laughs> i'm just thinking of like when when i find myself in a situation where where if i'm on stage and it's like okay we're bickering we're fighting now i go into my head and i'm like okay I'm, here i am again in my head um we're fighting um well now the first stop because you just said it was like okay go to my partner is there another thing and that might just be the answer but where you're thinking of like a, a correction a way to pop out of that that fight that you've that you kind of em employ here's a here's a great way to get out of fight say i'm sorry Hey, I'm sorry. I'm being an asshole today. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because my back hurts mm. or maybe because I woke up on the wrong side of the bed or maybe because I got fired from my job or whatever detail you want to bring to the table. But by saying you're sorry that you're communicating to your partner that you don't want to fight. Um, I'm not saying it's a, you know, that's, that's a really straightforward way of doing it. You can do, you can say, I'm sorry in a million ways. But the way to, you know, you ask yourself, do you want to fight with this person and in the context of the scene or whatnot? And if you do, then why do you want to fight with this person? And it has to happen lightning quick mm -hmm. because you're not going to be like, hmm, why am I fighting? But that's really when you're like you and sometimes giving your partner the information of why you're angry is mm. a great gift. And that is taking care of your partner and making your partner look good. It's like, I'm sorry, I'm really unloading on you and you don't deserve this, you know? Um, Here's and a tr trick that I find I use, even with my own children. You're dug in, and since they were little, like there would be a terrible fight in the car and we're on some tantrum, some path that like, I can't, I can't find a good way out of a good conversation point out of. And I would say, did you see that purple cat? <laughs> and they would both stop instantly <laughs> and start looking around. And be like, what, where are you? <laughs> so for me, I'll go to my environment, not to deny mm. what my partner is going through, not mm. to 
uh, you know, I certainly don't want to do that. And I'm bringing them along with us. But anything uh, to get out of this conversation that I don't want to prolong, whether mm. it is like, oh, my God, you're bleeding. Um, you know, or uh, <laughs> anything, certainly we're talking about this. It, it is, it's a great way to use your environment or use an external thing. And we, it, again, truthfully, that happens to us all the time. You could be in the middle of something. Someone's at the door. You, you start talking and then right. the dog starts right. barking or, you know, something that the, the pot overboils or whatever the heck you're doing. There's something that can influence this environment that makes it a, uh, a a detail that helps in context of the scene. You could be like fighting something. It's like, oh, the, the, the party goers are here or whatever party goes. Uh, party, the party goers. <laughs> or, you know, oh, your mother's here or whatever. You could have some outside influence. And then you create a great tension that is necessary in these scenes instead of just boom, 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 like table that. Uh, if, by the way, just on a side note, if you ever want to watch a great scene of tension check out the genesis reunion video <laughs> I, was just tell, I was just telling my son about this they get the five of uh, well, the five uh, uh main uh members of genesis together that haven't been in the same room together in like 30 years and they're all english so they're all like really wound up and uh it's just a wonderful exercise in watching people which <laughs> you, you've talked about tension before and i can feel like it like in a real i don't know if, if you want to like dive into that a little bit that's kind of reminds similar to fighting right or before you said there can be tension with without necessarily fighting mm -hmm, sure. mm -hmm. uh, and that's really um say a couple where one has decided to leave and the other is instead of fighting about it you know you're taking a different angle uh, whether it's like, I get it. I'm hard to live with, you know, and Janet is definitely, it definitely seems easier going, you know, than I do. I don't know. Um, there's still that tension there. There's something super big happening, but, uh, you know, just naturally if you're in a, you know, public place and you hear people fighting, like, don't you just in you instinctively kind of want to get away. You want to move away from that. Nobody enjoys watching that unless mm -hmm. it has, uh, gosh, what would be the variable? Cause I know I've seen fights on stage that were hilarious. Oh yeah. I mean, cause, cause again, you can heighten and explore that and the fight can be, you know, get, more detailed and it is entertaining um but tr arguments can you know the if they just have a straight anything any scene if you just have a straight trajectory it's not as enjoyable as uh like a roller coaster style where there's all sorts of twists and turns and there's a loop and oh here comes the drop and, but, yeah. and also, sorry, no, no. maybe it's just that fighting is one note Mm -hmm. And that you're just mm -hmm. repetitively mm -hmm. hearing over and over again. And that's what's so unpleasing about it. But if you can find the variations of the tension between two people, that will parlay itself into an interesting moment to watch. But bickering is, is no fun. There is a style of improv where people just get louder and louder on stage, which, I mean, hey, that's a choice. But it seems to be, you know, repetitive, like it's stagnant. So. And you think that is the difference? Because there is definitely a philosophy out there that no fighting is good. Fighting is part of, you know, the conflict that we want to watch. And so I wouldn't shut it down altogether. But I think no. I think we're all trying to find out, well, why is one form of fighting fun, interesting to be in and fun to watch? And, and other forms are just boring mm. torture. Yeah, I mean, because some again with attention, if you're like having an argument and you're in your and you're in a church and you have to whisper through everything, or during a wedding, mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one time in real life, Steph and I uh, went to a wedding and we were having an argument and it was incredibly tense and we really weren't fighting, we just weren't talking. So it, it was a lot. You know, it's a it's there's many different ways to play an argument. You and handled one. Uh, I was pregnant at the time, so I do. That's probably. Oh, she's gonna use that card. <laughs> <laughs> you handled this. You applied this really well in the previous Austin show in the River Mermaid scene, because it started off uh, as a scene about you as a married couple, you know, and, and Steph was the wife. The River Mermaid mm -hmm. was sort of a surprise. I, I, could, it just felt like you came up with it 
the moment you said it. And then it sort of turned into that. And, and then Bob was gradually becoming more annoyed at your character and a little bit more infatuated by the river mermaid. And instead of you saying, well, I know I can be a lot, like you explained earlier, you, you even, you just showed us and you made the original wife character a little bit hard to be around. And it justified Bob getting annoyed and, and it moved things along so that as a viewer, it was such an easy, it was just such an easy um, leap to say like, yeah, Bob should be with a river mermaid. This is, I can tell why he's being seduced by this strange creature. <laughs> His personal life sucks. Well, and it kind of goes full circle back to what you were saying in the beginning, Eric, which is, you know, how do you how, how do you move a scene along, make your choices based on, you know, uh, how can I give my other, my scene partner reason to move this story along? Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you're on stage and you're one of the main characters, if you can kind of, you know, pick at a sore and like in a scene we just did, Bob was... Um, taking an art class. And that's what he, I kind of made him, he couldn't, there were so many, he couldn't choose a color or whatever. And then I nurtured him into, you know, like, well, here, I'll pick some paints for you. And you look like a blue kind of person and then set him down. And I was like, you're an artist, you can do anything. And then the minute he picked up a brush, I was like, you're going to use that brush. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of like, you know, now I'm just going to play on what he's already established, which is he has insecurities about making his own choices. He's not a, you know, confident person. And she was picking up on my cues on that. So it was, it, mm. it's, that, that's what I mean. Is like, there's assumptions that are made when, and I'm not even sure, like, I might make a statement. Like, I didn't, I was indecisive, but it was more because I wasn't sure, you know, on, on the choice of the scene or whatever. And so she took that indecisiveness and made it in, an insecurity mm -hmm. and heightened that stuff. And we get, we look for those cues, all of those human cues all the time. And we might not act like in real life, we might not act on it, but you know, you see people and you go, you can, you, I mean, we become very good at um, observing human behavior and it's, it's important on stage to mm -hmm. be able to observe the human behavior that's going on. It's like I can't make a decision. And then I turned him in because like you said, he wasn't necessarily insecure about himself. And then I started painting him in this play of like, oh, it's okay. You know, like I know it's nerve wracking to whatever. He ran with that. He was totally like, instead of like, I'm going to hear I've got this variety of choices to make. It's like, oh, okay, she's telling me I'm insecure. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, so it is a matter of doing exactly what he said. It's like uh, listening to what your partner is saying and supporting that, you know, with your uh, pumping them up and build, you know, yes, ending, yes, ending exactly what they're saying. So uh, as an audience, we all know it almost, uh, you know, what we're what we're coloring together, what we're creating. It's the thing I've said a ton, which is like everything set on stage is said for a reason. It's us, it's up to us to figure out what it, it what the reasons are. And mm -hmm. so, listening to your partner, why is she talking to me like I'm a, a baby animal? Which is you know she was very. It's like oh, I guess I'm a baby animal. Like you know, or, or, I mean, I'm very weak and timid and insecure. And um, and those are the things that we want to. They're you know they're subtle. Uh, the subtlety of it is is some of the of the skill in it because you don't want to be overtly coming in as like why are you so insecure you know that that's you know mm -hmm. that's we would never speak like that right um, so finding other ways to communicate those things and it's it's uh, it's just listening to your partner's cue feels like full circle to Eric describing a feeling of being supported when he played with Steph and was directed by you Bob um, and that feels like I I understand the how you accomplish that a little better by just understanding cues making them look right avoiding that conflict and, and some of the things that we and not spending too much time in the decision making getting too frozen in your like which way to you know which way to go yeah because one thing leads to the next so there's you know there's a lot to unfold as things go on I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I could go on forever. I want to be mindful of, of your time here. We're at an hour already. Oh, um, 